verses 1 through 9. Is everybody warm enough? Anybody too warm? You too warm? <laughs> if I need to turn it down, we can. Robin says she's too warm back there. <laughs> Hallelujah. I came in. I came in. You know, I just had those moments. <laughs> See, I think you might call it senior moment. I come in, and I, I was chilled to the bone. So I thought I'd get a little bit of the chill out of the air. I turned the heat on just a little bit, so it may get too hot. I don't know. Acts chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 1. As we start tonight, we're going to read verses 1 through 9, and we'll uh, start, uh, start our study there. In Acts chapter 9, verse, verse 1. And th this is a fascinating story, one of the most fascinating ever, because it talks about one of the most important conversions that ever happened. Uh, now, God's all about converting the lost. But he's also about taking somebody, not only does he convert them, but he transforms them. Uh, he makes them into somebody new. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And perhaps there's no greater example of that than what we see hap that happened in the life of the Apostle Paul before he became the Apostle Paul. Because before he becoming the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was Saul, the persecutor of the church, of the early believers. Saul's greatest desire was to stop the spread of the gospel, to stop the power of God from being manifest, to stop new believers from preaching the gospel and, and from winning people over to Christ. Uh, during that time period when he was Saul, the persecutor, uh, during that time, believers were still able to go into many synagogues and to debate the scriptures. And so you had a lot of early believers that were going into the synagogues and they're debating Jesus Christ. They're going over the Old Testament scriptures. They're going over uh, things like, like the words of the prophet Isaiah and some of the other words of the prophets. They didn't have the New Testament, of course, because it was in the process of being lived out. Uh, but they would take the Old Testament prophecies, which is a little more difficult to do than what we have today. We have, we're looking back at Christ, looking back at Him coming, looking back at His sacrifice, looking back at His ascension, and looking forward to His coming. But all they could do is look forward. And they could look to the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, concerning Jesus, and, and they could look at those but, but, you know, it, it was a little bit harder to preach Jesus then. And that, that's all they had was the Old Testament scriptures. But, but uh, Paul wanted to stop the spread of the gospel. He, he fought against it. Let's look at verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, which means he's threatening of murder, against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him of the high priest letters to Damascus, Damascus is 150 miles away from Jerusalem where Paul was, or Saul was. But he wanted letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of, of this way, which means the believers, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. So he's made the 150 mile journey. He's almost there. And suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus is saying to Saul, why persecutest thou me? Look at the words of Jesus here. But this, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Jesus didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my believers? He said, why are you persecuting me? We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And in uh, and, and verse 5, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, continue on to Damascus, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. In other words, continue your journey. I'll tell you when you get there. I'll tell you later on. 
And, and, and the men which journeyed with, with uh, Saul stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Acts chapter uh, 22, I think it is, tells us they, didn't hear, they, they heard a voice, couldn't understand what was being said. They didn't know what the voice was saying, they just heard it. But they saw nobody. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. He was blind. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So I'm going to stop right there, and we'll start getting into our study tonight. Uh, you know, I, I, looked at, I looked at this, and I thought, my first, th my first thought was, why would God go to such great lengths to win, uh, win Saul? Why Saul? Out of everybody, why Saul? And I've got a good answer for that, and I'll give it to you in a moment. But you know, God wants all of us to be saved, but he doesn't, he doesn't just save us just for the sake of saving us. He saves us and he gives us a purpose. Every man, every woman, every young person that's been saved, they've been saved because, but one of the reasons they've been saved, not only, it's not just to keep them out of hell, but part of it is that they are divinely called to fill a purpose, to fill a purpose in the church, Amen. And, 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 what we, and what Saul did not realize is that all of his life, God had been preparing him for this day. Uh, the, his, edu his former education and, and the cultures that he had been exposed to, uh, the Grecian culture and the, and the uh, we had called it uh, the Hellenistic culture and, and the Hebrew culture, God had had him learning from both of those different cultures within the Jewish community and being schooled in, in those things, growing up with Hellenists, yet, uh, yet learning as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And uh, so, so God was training Paul all this time. God had his hand on him, and he's getting him ready for this conversion to take place. He's getting him ready for the day following Pentecost, when the, when the Holy Ghost-empowered church would go out preaching the gospel, and then they would be fought against, the devil would try to stop them, because what you have to realize is all those men that fought against the church, like, like Saul, uh, it was not just a human thing, it was not just a flesh and bone coming against the church thing. Satan was behind all of that. And God knew that, that Satan would someday use Saul, but God said, but in the process of Satan taking him and trying to get him this hatred built up and all this disdain for the church, I'm going to prepare him so that when I convert him, he's ready to do great things for me. Now, I'll explain that to you now. Uh, because, uh, you know, the Greek culture had been, was very influential in, in Paul's day. And the reason it was because, uh, because Alexander the Great had conquered uh, you know, many, many parts of the world uh, prior to the Rome, Roman uh, government taking over. And, and so the, but, the, but even though the Romans by now had taken over pretty much the world, the Grecian culture was still very thick and it spread all throughout the land. And so the Jews that had been dispersed and lived in some of these other cities had gotten very used to the Greek culture, if you will the Greek uh, ways of worship, the Greek arts, and all those things. And, 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 so, and they speak a different language and all these things. And then you've got the Hebrews, uh, which are called Hebrews. You've got the Hellenistic side, the, the Greek-speaking Jews. You've got the, the Hebrews who speak Hebrew, and, and they are very staunch legal, legalist people. They're legalistic. And Hellenistic means they're Greek. Uh, Greek speaking, uh, Greek influenced by Greek culture, uh, and, and but the Hebrews, the other side of that is the Hebrews, and and, and they 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 have the law of Moses, and they and then, then of course they have the Pharisees. The Pharisees are uh, are in the Hebrew movement, the Hebrew side, and the Pharisees have written many many other laws and many many other rules to go by other than the Bible other than the scriptures that they had. And so they made a lot of rules up outside of what they already had to follow. And, and, and the, on the Hellenistic side, uh, where they lean more to the arts and, 
and, uh, and those things, they had the Sadducees. And the Sadducees being a part of the Hellenist movement, uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't believe in the, for whatever reason, didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe really in life after death. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but they were not ready to receive Christ. Neither, neither set was. And the amazing thing was that there'd be a day when the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and this was true in Paul's day, when they would join together. The only time they're going to work together is to fight against Christ. Uh, they, they could not see eye to eye. They could not get along. But when it came to, to resisting the message of Jesus Christ, they could be best friends. And so they would join together in resisting the work of Jesus Christ, in resisting the message. They probably had people back then that wore shirts that said, resist. Amen. Now, you know, I, I said something in church about those t-shirts one day, and then I, then I discovered, I watched some young people, I discovered that some of them were wearing resist. It was associated with our D.A.R.E. program. And I thought, wow, I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> because they're talking about resisting the drug culture, amen? So uh, I, while I'm thinking of it, I'll just put that two cents in there now. Uh, but uh, for, for uh, here's why God selected Paul. For a man to, to be able to go over the world and preach and preach to the Gentiles and win the Jews too and have influence over him, he needed to be exposed to the Hellenistic culture, but he also needed to know all about the Hebrews. He had to be able to relate to them. The Apostle Paul, because of his upbringing, uh, he could certainly, uh, he had an understanding of both sides of the, of the Jewish population. And so Paul was God's chosen instrument. So that's why I was telling you, due to Paul's upbringing, uh, his parents, I, I'm, I'm told that at the age of 14, Paul would have been considered a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And that is his parents, they, they were steeped in Hebrew culture, and they were very strong Pharisees, and Paul even calls himself, he said, I'm the, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In other words, I am just as, I am as a Pharisee as you can possibly be. He was a very legalistic person, and, and, and wanted everybody else to abide by the laws that the Pharisees had put out there. But, but at the same time, those who lived around him in Tarsus were Hellenistic. And so, so Paul, uh, as, as a boy, as Saul, as 14 years old, the kids that he played with and the kids that he went to school with and all those things, they were Hellenistic. And so he's, he's very much aware of all of that, and he's been exposed to it very strongly. And then there comes a day when he's past the school age, now it's time to go off into the higher education and his parents had a choice to make, and they could let him be schooled right there where they live, close to where they live in Asia Minor, or they could send him back to Jerusalem. And they choose, they said, we, we want to get him out of this Hellenistic culture. We're going to send him back to Jerusalem, and we're going to put him under uh, uh, Gamaliel. Gama, how do you say that? G Gamaliel, yes. That's a, thank you, Brother Bobby. <laughs> and uh, we're going to put him under him, under Gamaliel, and he's going to train him, he's going to school him, and, and, and this is a university of the Hebrews, and he's going to learn more about the Hebrew culture and, and the Hebrew way of interpreting the scriptures and all these things. And so that's what they did. And, and, and so, beginning in, verse chap in, 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 in chapter 9, God apprehends Saul. God apprehends Saul. You know, one thing about God, he knows how to get your attention. I want you to keep this in mind. If you're praying for loved ones to be saved, it looks like they're only getting further away. If God can convert somebody like Saul, I'm telling you, God knows how to get a hold of your loved ones. Amen? And, and, and here's what we pray sometimes. We pray, God, open their eyes. Open their eyes. Well, that's what God was doing through, the, through Saul. And, and, and God stopped him. I can, I can see Saul and his, companion, his traveling companions now. Saul is so happy. He's got those letters to the, to the priest there over in Damascus. He can walk in those synagogues and show them those, those letters from the high priest. Boy, they carry great weight in the synagogues. He's, going to, he's willing to walk, probably walk, 150 miles because the, because the Christians are being dispersed, and wherever they're being dispersed, you know, we, we, we studied a previous chapter about the stoning of Stephen, and Christians are spreading out everywhere, 
And the devil thinks he's going to stop the spreading of the gospel. This thing is spreading like wildfire. And Paul said, I've got control here in Jerusalem. I don't have any control over in Damascus. I don't have any control over in Judea. I don't have any control over in Galilee. But if I can get letters from the high priest, I'll go to those towns. I'll walk every step of the way. I'll sweat. I'll work. I'll labor. I'm going to put a stop to this. Because he hated the message of Jesus Christ. He hated Christ. You know, he hated the message. He hated those who lived it. He hated those who preached it. He hated those who met under the name of Jesus. And so he's out to stop it. And, and, and so he, God, but God knows his background. And God says he's a perfect instrument. God, and I've always looked at this and thought God had such a sense of humor in that he's going to take the chief weapon that the devil has and say, let me get in there and do some tweaking and some changing. And I'm going to change him from a hater to a lover. I'm going to turn him into somebody who wants to follow me with all of his heart. And who will work for me even harder than he worked for the devil. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I think when God looked at, uh, he, God already knew this. As I said, this did not catch God by surprise. He didn't look at Saul one day and say, wow, wow, look at what he's doing. He knew what Saul was going to become all along. But I, I do think there probably was a time when God looked upon Saul and said, look how hard he's working for the devil. The funny thing is, I'm about to change him, and he's going to work like that for me. Somebody wrote a song called Working for God, Working Like the Devil for God. Or Working for, Like the Devil for... Now, I've I seen some faces. I, I'm just kind of the same way when I heard that. I thought, I don't know if I like that or not. But I know what they mean. The devil never lets up. The devil never takes a break. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, the devil's on the job. And if we work like the devil for the Lord, that means I work non-stop for God. Amen? That's what it's kind of getting at. But, uh, God, but God apprehends him. And look at verse 1 again. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest. So Saul wants to stop him. He will stop him by any means necessary. He will have him put in jail. He will have him arrested. And the Bible said both men and women. He got papers from the priest, the high priest, saying we can arrest, we can chain, we can bind, we can torture both men and women, and we will bring them the 150-mile trip back to Jerusalem, and we will throw them in jail for preaching Jesus, for singing about Jesus, for living for Jesus. We'll throw them in jail. If you're going to get arrested for anything, let it be that it's because you spoke up for Christ. If you're going to end up in jail and spend a few nights in jail or even one, let it be for the fact that you stood up for Jesus Christ and you did not back down in the face of adversity and you preached Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. Go ahead and give me a hand clap of praise. But we look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, And he desired of him, the high priest, letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, uh, that if he found any of the way, any of the way, I like that, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. We discussed that. He's determined to stop them. And he's going to try to take over these Christian leaders, stop them in their tracks. And he assumed, he assumed, if I can take out these leaders, if I can threaten them, if, I can, if we can have them murdered, if, if we can put them in jail and get them out of the way, this thing will die out. We will finally put an end to Christianity. Did you know there are a lot of people today that have it in their mind that if they can just continue what they're doing, they'll put a stop to the church. They'll put an end to our preaching. They will put an end to what we testify to, to what we preach. There are folks today that are trying to infiltrate the church, and they're trying to pre change the Word. They're trying to rip pages out of the Bible. If, if, they, if they can't defeat us by shutting us down, what they want to do is get in here and just say, well, we'll act like one of them. We will befriend them, and we will convince them to change their message. We will convince them that the things that they have once stood against are okay. I'll tell you that the devil has put them up to that 
But we've got to keep going back to the Word, back to the Word, and just stand on what the Word of God says and preach what the Word of God says. Amen? It doesn't matter if the mainstream media doesn't like it. It doesn't matter if the political correctness crowd does not like it. We've got to keep preaching Jesus and Him crucified and resurrected. We've got to keep telling people that there's a difference in living right and not living right. We've got to keep naming sin, not to beat up on people, but to let them know you may be bound now, but there's a God who can set you free. There's a God who can change your life. Glory to God. There was a I read the story that just the other day of a guy who had been on the X Factor. I, don't, I can't even remember what the X Factor, X Factor was, but some reality show. And he had been on the X Factor. When he appeared on the X Factor, he appeared as a homosexual. And I think a, a trans, whatever, cross dresser or something or another, and, and transgender. And, and he was on there, and boy, they really liked him. But after he appeared on the X Factor, and his career there was over, like the Apostle Paul, he met Christ. And when Jesus got a hold of him, he saved him, he delivered him, and set him free. And he took off the women's clothes and put back on man clothes, men's clothing, and he went around telling everybody, he said, he said, when I was on the X Factor, you know me as whatever. He said, but I met Jesus. And he changed my life and delivery. I'm no longer a homosexual. I'm no longer a cross-dresser. I'm telling you, the media is to, there today. They are ripping him apart. They are accusing him of being a traitor. They are saying, you can't tell the world that. We're trying to promote this, and you're tearing it down. They don't like him. And he's got a whole world that's coming against him, but he's got a God who stands with him. Amen. amen. Come on, somebody shout amen. But, but so Paul thought, if I can get the key leaders out of the way, it'll be all right. But what, Paul, what Saul did not know is God is getting ready to change his life and make him one of those he's been fighting against. Soon he's going to join the work of the Messiah. And look at verse 3, chapter 9, verse 3. And as, as Saul journeyed, he came near Damascus. He almost reached the end of that 150-mile journey. Can you imagine... It, it, what, what a three hour drive if you, if you drove in fact I looked this up and on the map it said it's a five hour drive 150 must be a rough road or some winding roads or something it looked like they were five hour and something drive from Jerusalem to Damascus to travel 150 miles Paul was on foot or either maybe an animal to, at the most can you imagine 150 miles it would take about seven days for a man to make that trip back then and that's, that is, he had to stay out. I don't know if he's on a horse or foot. But, but it would take a long time to make that journey either way. Amen? And I just want to throw that in there. It didn't cost you anything extra. But verse 3 begins the narrative of one of Christianity's greatest conversions. Greatest conversions to ever take place. Saul of Tarsus. And, and, and so Saul, he sees this light. And I want you to picture this in your mind. This light is so bright. In a later chapter, Paul would tell us, he said, it was brighter than the sun. Imagine that. He sees a light that the Apostle Paul says is brighter than the S-U-N, the sun. Brighter than that. I'm telling you, if you, you want to know what that's like, get out in the morning about 7 o'clock and drive around Paragol. Drive back over from uh, where the... Uh, Preschool is, not the, pre, the primary, over on country, what is that? Country cl club, bro. get over there and, and, and go through the primary school and come back this way. See what it's like about 7 o'clock in the morning. You'll know, amen? Brighter than the sun. And I see Paul, I see the men with him and they're doing like this. And the light is so bright in the presence of, because it's, the, it's, the, it's Jesus, Jesus, it's not, it's not just a light, it's Jesus. And it is so bright that they're doing like this. And then the Bible said they go down. They go down on their knees. They go down pretty much on their all fours because they're in a presence unlike anything else they've ever been in before. There's something about it when you come in the presence of Jesus, amen? And so they go, they go down and, and Paul, Paul sees this light and he confessed that it's... In fact, let me, let me take you to Acts... I said 22, I think, earlier. 
It's Acts 26. Acts 26, look at, let's begin verse 12. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus, he's, he's re, now he's go, looking back. He said, with authority and commission of the chief priest. He said in verse 13, At midday, O king, I saw the way. I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me, about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have, listen to this, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Glory to God. Amen. We didn't, we didn't read that in the first, in, in, over in Acts chapter 9, but now we, hear, we can find out more information. Verse 17, 18, we'll read those two. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I, now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Oh, glory to God. God's going to take the very chief persecutor and he says, now I'm going to take you and you're going back to the crowd that you work for. You're going back to the crowds who cheered you on. You're going back to the crowds that you, that you helped incite them with anger and bitterness and you're going to preach to them and I through you are going to open their eyes that they may see. Glory to God. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise. So you talk about a dramatic conversion. This is a dramatic conversion. Uh, and, and it's a whole, it's a 180. Paul made a complete turnaround. And, and now he's a different person. Old things are passed away. All, now I know what that means. All, all old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Glory to God. Not only, not only is his mission different, but he's got a new name now. Amen. He's got a new name. I, Amen? Praise God. So he fell to the earth. He heard this voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Here's the thing. Uh, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And somebody would probably speak up and say, well, it wasn't Jesus. It was, it was men and women who preached Jesus. But then, you remember what Jesus said to his disciples? He said in Matthew, let's see, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 25, around verse 45, Jesus says to his disciples, he said, uh, or he says to some people, he said, I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was in prison and you did not, you did not minister to me. I was sick and you, did not, you, didn't, you didn't try to help me. And somebody said, well, Jesus, when did we see you thirsty? And, not, and, not, and I mean, they're really getting bent out of shape. And Jesus said, he, he said, when you didn't do it to these people around you. And then he says to his disciples, his followers, he said, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to see me. I was sick and you prayed for me. And somebody said, but when, when did we do that, Jesus? We don't, we, we don't remember you ever being sick. We don't remember you ever being naked. We, uh, we don't remember that. He said, when you've done it unto the least of these. When you've done it unto the ones the world will turn their heads, turn up their noses and walk away from. When you've done it to them, you've done it to me. And that's why Jesus says to Saul, he said, why have you persecuted me? I'm telling you, those women, those little ladies, those precious little women that was, had been converted that are out there living for Jesus and working for him, and those men that were out there living this faith and not ashamed of it, they were working for Jesus. And when you touch them, you touch Jesus. When you mess with them, you're messing with Jesus. When you hurt them, it hurts Jesus. And he said, when you've done it to them, you've done it to me. Amen? Praise God. The next time you do a kind deed for somebody, remember that. Because, and I think Jesus would have us to remember that. You know, you help somebody out of a situation, you're helping Jesus. Because, because in helping others, we're doing it for the Lord, doing it to Him. Uh, you know, there, uh, here, and here, here's also the, 
uh, hold on a minute, I lost my train of thought. But we know, we know even today, believers around the world are being persecuted. They're, they're, uh, in, in just the last few years, there have been a number of people. Well, we know that that, uh, that gospel minister, Christian minister, just released from, uh, where was it? Turkey, yeah. Uh, you know, he, they can say what they want to. He was put in prison for preaching the gospel. Amen. Uh, it, it flew in the face of all that they believed. And, and there are thousands more like him. You, you can find them in China. You can find them, you can find them in, in uh, Muslim countries. You can find them everywhere that are being mistreated, that are being killed, that are put, being put in prison. Why? Because they won't bow to a false god. Amen. And, and they're willing to sacrifice it all. And it's hard to, it's hard to kick against the pricks. I want to get there, verse 5. And he said unto me, why, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What are the pricks? The pricks are, they had uh, uh, people in that day, farmers, that used oxen to plow. They used oxen to pull carts and things. They had a long wooden stick. And on the end of that wooden stick, that they had walked behind the oxen with, they also, on the end of that wooden stick, there was a sharp piece of metal on the end of it, attached to the end of it. And they would walk behind the oxen, and when the oxen wanted to stop, they would take that wood stick with that sharp metal instrument, and they would stick them in the leg. Stick them in the leg. Sometimes that ox, that, those oxen would want to kind of buck up a little bit, kick back or whatever. And, and when they've done it, they've got that stick held, holding up there behind them. When they kick, they're kicking that. Very painful. And so what Jesus is saying to Paul, Paul, I'm pushing you forward. I'm taking you to a place that you, in your flesh, did, that you do not want to go. And, he, and, and I think something else that Jesus is saying to Paul here is, he said, you know, you're kicking against the goads, the pricks. This, I have brought people out of bondage of the law. I have brought them out of the bondage of, of legalism. I have brought them out of the bondage of man-made religion. And I have given them a relationship with my Father. It's only available through me. And you've been fighting against it. That's why you're, you're full of so bitterness. That's why you've got so much hatred inside of you. But today it's going to all end. Glory to God. He's kicking against the pricks. It hurts. It's painful. It's painful to his mind. He can't rest at night. I see, the, I see Saul twisting and turning at night thinking, I can't, how am I going to stop him? And Jesus said it's painful when you kick against the pricks. Amen? How many know what I'm talking about tonight? But Jesus is taking him forward. Hallelujah. And, and so, so, when you've got an old stubborn ox, and you take that, that goad, and you just kind of give him a nudge, and that old stubborn ox, he does not like pain. He will respond to that pain and go, and you can nudge him on this side and get him to go that way. Nudge him on that side and get him to cut. So you can kind of steer him by, by the farmers behind him by nudging him. And, and I, think, I think that's kind of what Jesus was doing to, to Saul. I'm steering you to the cross. I'm taking you to the message of salvation. You're stubborn as an old ox. And you may not want to go. But I'm going to get you there anyway. You got, I want to say it again, you've got loved ones that are lost, you keep praying for them because there's a power that will get behind them and will begin to gouge them and make them miserable and lead them to the cross. Oh, I know God cannot force himself on anybody. He won't make you serve him, but he can sure stir up the nest and make you so uncomfortable that you, you can't do anything else but think about it. Amen? Praise God. So the metaphor suggests that Saul is like an old stubborn ox. And God said, I'm, I'm going to get your attention one way or the other. Now look at verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me, have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So here's the thing. You remember last week when I told you that sometimes God only gives us one step at a time? Most of the time, God does not give, give us the entire plan. I wonder if God had showed Saul on the road to Damascus around the time he saw the bright light if God would have said let me play this out for you like a movie and roll the projector and show 
that, that after he's converted to Saul, all the suffering he's going to go through. Saul, uh, Saul might have got up and went, I don't like what I see. I don't like the thought of being shipwrecked. I don't like those beatings. I don't like being in prison. I don't like the thought of being chained up in an old musky dungeon. Lord, go get somebody else. But God only showed him one day at a time. And he said, Saul, I just want you to get up and go, to, go on to Damascus. You're almost there. Go on to Damascus. And you wait there, and I'll tell you what you're going to do later. You know what? That's, that's stepping out on faith. But the thing was, when Saul stood up, he couldn't see. And so the only way he could obey God, he had to get somebody to help him. And the guys that were traveling with him took him by the hand and led him on to Damascus. You know what? I believe that we know that the reason he's blind, it was a divine intervention. God took his sight from him because the Lord was going to make sure that when he got through with Saul, he would not be Saul any longer. He was going to make sure that while he sat over in Damascus for the next three days, that he had his full attention, that he wasn't going to be distracted by things going on outside his room, outside the window, outside the tent door, whatever he was. He had him, I, the only thing Saul could do is think about Jesus three, for three days, three full days. He had no distractions. God knows how to get your attention. Amen. How many don't tell the truth tonight? Praise God. So look at verse 7. And the men journeyed with him and stood speechless, hearing a voice. They didn't understand it, but they heard it. And seeing no man. Saul saw the bright light. These guys evidently didn't see that. And so they get up. They're speechless. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what to make out of all this. They'll learn later on. But uh, so, so God gets him back over in Damascus. And he goes in. He's staying somewhere. Three days. He, the, and here's the other thing the Bible tells us. He doesn't, eat, he doesn't eat nor drink water for three days. That's about as long as you can go without drinking water. Your kidneys are shut down physically. So for three days, he doesn't have anything to eat or drink. He's just thinking Jesus. Jesus. And I believe all that time, God's saying, though he can't see in the natural, I think he can see in the spiritual. And I think Jesus is beginning to show him, here's what I'm going to do through your life. I'm going to use you. Here's the message I want you to preach. And here's the effect it's going to have. The message I'm going to give you is going to resonate. It's going to go out and pull, draw people in. I think he's getting excited. I've been fighting against this, but now I can, even though he couldn't see the natural, now he can see in the spiritual. And, God, and I think Jesus said, I want you to concentrate on the spiritual sight that's been given to you. I think there on the road to Damascus, Paul was converted. Amen? And, and so... And then God begins to work on somebody else. Look at verses 8 and 9. And I'm going to try to close pretty quickly. But, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither did he eat nor drink. So that light was bright. He closed his eyes. When he opened it, he couldn't see anything. And uh, so during these three days, he couldn't think of anything but what Jesus wanted him to think on. And uh, he, all the distractions are removed. Now look at verses 10 through 16. And there was a certain disciple, not, a, not an apostle, but a disciple, at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. Ananias is about to wish he hadn't answered. <laughs> and, and the Lord said unto him, Arise. And go into the street, which is called Straight, Straight Street. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. You know, in other words, Saul's over there praying. And he and, ha, and hath seen in a vision. In other words, Saul, Saul has seen this. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man. I think he says it with a trembling voice. How much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he had the authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on the name, on thy name. News travels fast. A hundred and fifty mile space, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have jet airplanes. They didn't, they didn't even have airplanes. I don't think they even had homing pigeons. Smoke signals couldn't even travel that far. And Ananias said, 
I know all about this man. And I know about his mission. I know why he came. And he said, now, Lord, <laughs> surely there's somebody else you can get to go over there other than me. <laughs> that's, I'm, that's paraphrasing it. And, and, and here he had authority from the chief priest uh, to, uh, to bind all that call on thy name. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings. Listen, Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. Can you imagine when Saul heard those words from God? You are going to speak for me to Gentiles and to kings and to, and to the nation of Israel. I think when the Lord first told him that, Paul had no idea that he would be speaking to kings from a prison or as a prisoner. He probably had no idea about that. For I will show, the, show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So there come a time when his eyes were open to those things. But this is a divine setup. God is setting up Saul. He's changing his name. He's changing his identity. He's changing everything. In other words, Saul is a chosen vessel. Amen. And so later on, when, he, when, he's, when he's got that name changed, when he's going by Paul, he's going to look back and realize that even as a boy, when, he's, when his parents are shifting him around and moving him back to Jerusalem to be schooled, he's going to realize God had his hand on that all that time. Even when I acted like a heathen, even when I didn't believe in Jesus, when I fought against it, all the while God is working, preparing me. Can I tell you something? It's true for all of us. Even before we, we were converted, God was already busy. He was already busy working on our lives. I believe probably before even Paul, Saul saw the bright light on the road to Damascus, there were probably already times that the Holy Ghost moved upon him. There were probably already times that, that the message of Jesus began to do something to him. That may be why he was so ill about it, was because it was eating at him. Amen? I've met a lot of people that fought against it. And some of them made some of the best workers for God you ever, you'd ever see. Amen? And so what I come to tell you, looking, I probably all of us tonight can look back in our past. We can look back in our life B.C. before Christ and see the handiwork of God. See, even when we were out there doing our own thing and, and rejecting God and, and, and living like heathens, that God had His hand on us. I, you know, I, I look back at my life, and there were t when I was a boy, I went to Sunday school. One of the reasons I liked Sunday school so good is because they gave me chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Juice and chocolate chip cookies. And if that teacher forgot those chocolate chip cookies, I reminded her. And she may be watching me right now. Sister Doris Cotton was one of them. And, and, and I'd say, you got any chocolate chip cookies today? Amen. <laughs> But all that time, God, I, I, I had a cousin that later on, she said, I knew all those years when we were children in Sunday school. She said, it didn't like you was paying attention. But when that teacher asked the questions, you spit those answers out. And she said, during those years, early years in Sunday school, God was preparing you for what you were going to become and what you were going to do for him. Amen. I was just a mean little boy sitting there cutting up thinking I'm just in there to get the chocolate chip cookies and God was working on me amen praise God I got I'm gonna quit right there anybody have anything you want to you want to add to it tonight or anything you want to